Valentina was 13 years old, the same age as Anne Frank during the Holocaust, when genocide began in Rwanda. Valentina's family was Tutsi, the ethnic minority that was targeted during the genocide. Because of this, when news of the mass killing spread to their village, her family made the difficult decision to pack their bags, leave their home, and walk to the safest place that they could imagine, their community church. Thousands of other Tutsi families joined them, praying that they would be safe. Within a matter of days, the Rwandan army and militias of civilians had surrounded this church. Armed with clubs, grenades, and machetes, they systematically slaughtered the men, women, and children hiding inside. Valentina watched in horror as her parents were murdered right before her eyes. Not knowing what else to do, she lay down next to their dead bodies, waiting to die. This saved her life. The militias mistook her for dead, and soon they left the church. Valentina did not leave. She lived in this church, among the bodies of her family, her friends, and her neighbors, for 43 days. At times, she did think about leaving, but since her parents had been murdered and her community had been completely destroyed, she had nowhere left to go. Today, Valentina lives here in the United States. And while she still confronts the trauma of what happened in Rwanda every day, she considers herself lucky. Lucky because she survived. Up to one million other people were not this lucky. One million. That is more than the entire population of Columbus. And this number doesn't even begin to take into account the hundreds of thousands of people who were raped, the millions of people who had to flee their homes, or the countless orphans who were left behind. We like to tell ourselves that genocide is rare. The reality is that Rwanda is one of many countries that experienced genocide during the past century. In fact, more people were killed during genocide last century than in all of the centuries international wars combined. We will never understand or know the toll that this loss of life has had on our world. Just think of the people killed by genocide, who could have been doctors, artists, lawyers, activists, teachers, or students like Valentina is today. People who could have been standing on TEDx stages just like this one, sharing ideas that could have changed the world. This loss of life, and in turn, this loss of culture, must be stopped. I believe that it can be. In fact, it is our responsibility to eradicate genocide. This is clearly a large responsibility. And it will clearly not be easy. But in order to do this, in order to eradicate genocide, we have to know three key things. What it is, why it happens, and how to respond. Let's begin, then, with what it is. Although genocides have taken place throughout human history, including right here in the United States, the term genocide is actually relatively recent. A Polish Jewish lawyer named Raphael Lemkin created the term in the wake of the Nazi Holocaust. After 49 of his family members perished during the Holocaust, he combined the Greek word genos, which means group, with the Latin suffix side, which means murder. For Lemkin, genocide was the destruction of a group. Lemkin lobbied tirelessly for the international community to adopt this term. And in a few short years, he succeeded. 
1948, countries of the world came together to create an international treaty outlawing genocide. This treaty used Lemkin's term, and in doing so, it took the very first important step toward eradication, naming it. As these leaders came together, they also vowed to prevent genocide from occurring in the future. The phrase, never again, echoed throughout the world. Today, we know that they were not successful. Actually, right now, as we sit here, privileged to listen to ideas on a beautiful college campus, the people in the Darfur region of the Sudan are enduring genocide. This violence began in 2003, and it joins the long list of genocides that have taken place since the Holocaust. This means that while naming genocide was a very important first step, it simply was not enough. We must also understand it. As a professor of sociology and criminology, I try to understand genocide. I became motivated to study genocide in a setting just like this one. I was a student, and my professor invited a speaker on genocide. As I sat in your seat, I was absolutely shocked as the speaker told us about genocides that I had never even heard of, like the violence in Guatemala or the violence in Bosnia. I could not believe that genocide continued to happen, and I hoped that one day I could understand why. Years later, I found myself sitting on a hillside in Valentina's home country of Rwanda. I was there conducting research, and that afternoon, I was interviewing a man named Jean-Paul. Jean-Paul had killed two people during the genocide, and he was serving out his sentence in a community service camp, which is where I was visiting him. You see, unlike Valentina, who was considered a Tutsi in 1994 and was targeted during the genocide, Jean-Paul was a Hutu, a member of the majority group. When the violence began, he was married and he had two children. He spent most of his time farming the land around his home. He had never committed a crime or done anything violent. But when the news of the mass killing spread to his village, local leaders convinced him that Tutsis were coming to kill his family. Determined to prevent this from happening, he joined a militia that was hunting Tutsi. Jean-Paul's actions were motivated, in large part, by fear. Fear that Tutsi could hurt his family. They were also motivated by an us-them ideology that he had learned from a very young age. You see, in school, Jean-Paul had been taught that Hutus and Tutsis were fundamentally different groups of people. In reality, Hutus and Tutsis are what sociologists call socially constructed groups. This means that there is nothing naturally distinct about them, just like races and ethnicities here in the US. But social constructions can feel very real. Talking with Jean-Paul that afternoon, it was really hard to imagine that he had committed genocide. We laughed and spoke about my experiences in Rwanda. He also told me about his grandchildren and about how we could not wait to finish his sentence so we could go home and hold them every day. This reminded me that the people who commit genocide are not fundamentally evil people. They are ordinary people who can do extraordinarily harmful things in certain social situations. The social situation, then, becomes key to understanding genocide. This fear that had motivated John Paul was actually widespread throughout Rwanda. There had been a civil war between Hutus and Tutsis just a few years before the genocide. This civil war had brought a lot of instability, a lot of distrust, and a lot of fear. This ideology that John Paul believed, that Hutus and Tutsis were fundamentally distinct groups, was also widely believed. Like Jean Paul, many people had learned this in school. Government leaders and political elites also manipulated people into believing it. They used the radio and magazines to tell people that Tutsis, like Valentina, were not human, that they were cockroaches that needed to be exterminated. This kind of thinking benefited these elites, 
who saw Tutsis as a threat and wanted them gone. More broadly, many of these factors that were present before the genocide in Rwanda are actually present before genocides worldwide. I've examined all genocides that have taken place since the Holocaust and identified risk factors that are present before violence. A civil war, like the civil war between Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda, is actually the number one risk factor of genocide. An ideology that excludes a segment of the population, like the ideology that casts Tutsis as outsiders and as cockroaches, is also common before genocide. Genocide is likewise much more likely to occur when political leaders feel threatened, often by a group trying to take their power, and when they have the capacity to respond to this threat by choosing genocide. This means that we actually know a great deal about why genocide happens, and it brings us further to the goal of eradicating genocide and to our final step, responding. A few years ago, I was interviewing refugees from Darfur, the region in Sudan that has seen violence since 2003. The men I was speaking with had fled their homes and traveled well over 1,000 miles to try to find safety. Throughout our conversation, they told me about the horrendous acts of violence that they witnessed back home, how Sudanese soldiers and militias known as the Janjaweed had entered their villages, killing and raping their family members and sending countless people to refugee camps like this one. After our conversation, I asked if any of them had questions of me. I will never forget this. Shata, a reserved 35-year-old man whose entire family had been killed in Darfur, quietly told me that he had a question. Looking me in the eye, he asked why people didn't care. Did people know that genocide was taking place in Darfur? That hundreds of thousands of people had been killed? That millions of people had been displaced? Did they know? And if they did know, why were they so silent? Why didn't they care? My initial reaction was defensive. I wanted to tell him that we did know and that we do care and that many movements in the U.S. and around the world were trying to respond to this genocide. But as I opened my mouth to say this, I couldn't. Because the truth is that he was right. These same socially constructed boundaries, this us-them thinking that divided Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda, or that cast Shata's group as different in Darfur, can also keep us from acting. You see, it is very easy to only focus on the problems that we believe affect us. It is much more difficult to care about problems affecting others, be it others here in the US or others in countries many miles away, like Rwanda or Sudan. This means that while us-them thinking is a prominent risk factor of genocide, it also prevents us from responding, especially when we don't think it affects us. To respond to genocide then, one of the first things that we have to do is simply to think about, be aware of, and act against this us-them thinking. Strive to care about people all over the world because we are all us and we are all interconnected. To respond to genocide, we must also confront ongoing violence. This will involve helping refugees like Shata, who are often thousands of miles from home in a strange and scary place without their families, without their friends, without their jobs, even without their native language. It will involve letting them know, in whatever way that we can, that we do care. Finally, to actually eradicate genocide, we have to look to the future. Because if we can understand genocide, we can use what we know about its risk factors to predict it. And if we can predict it, we should be able to prevent it. This is clearly not going to be easy. For starters, we still have much to learn about how the international community can effectively respond to genocide. This will also require much political will. 
This means that as you strive to care about people all over the world, this care must sometimes be turned into informed political action. Because as cliche as it sounds, indifference is an obstacle to eradicating genocide. It is surely not the only obstacle that we will face, but it is a very important place to start. So, to prevent the loss of future lives and the loss of rich culture, please take our responsibility seriously. Because I am certain that we will live in a world where we have eradicated genocide someday. Thank you.